You're never going to be able to guess what I'm finally building today, so don't even try. A rotary welding positioner. Introducing right round and baby right round. Like a record baby round. I can't even tell you how long I've wanted one of these things. I mean, absolutely no legitimate reason to have one, but why let that stop me now? Some people midlife crisis with fast fancy cars. Me? Rotary weld table. I'm sorry, what was that? What are these used for? What aren't they used for? Showboating. Pulitzer Prize winning cinematography. Hypnotizing people. Decorating cakes. Not to mention pottery, making barber poles, candy canes, and of course, imprisoning your arch nemeses. You have been caught in a further act of delicious teasing. General Frank Howarth, for your continued, and always entertaining, transgressions in wood. Matthias Wandel, for cutting a drill chuck arbor taper using an angle grinder. And it working. Jimmy Duresta, the internet just ain't big enough for both our fancy scarves. The decision of the council will now be heard. And in my case, every year or two, I might actually be able to weld something with this. But in order to do that, I'm going to have to build it first. So you're looking at the core components I've collected for this turntable build. I've got some of this broken down already, but here on the right you're looking at a 24 volt DC gearhead motor, and on the left, two worm drive right angle gearboxes. This is all used eBay stuff. You can see the gearboxes have seen a lot more use than the motor, but for what I need, they, they should be fine. They're not too clapped out. The motor, like I said, is 24 volt DC. It's got a 15 to one gear head built into it. It came with the control board, uh, two actually, a 24 volt power supply and a speed controller. It does, I believe, zero to 200 RPM. And just here on the bench, it feels quite torquey. I don't have a spec sheet for it, but it feels like it's got quite a bit of torque. I was actually looking for a treadmill motor and controller when I came across this thing. This was a tad more expensive than gutting an old treadmill, but it saves me the embarrassing conversation of explaining to my wife that I didn't really plan on starting a workout. This has a through shaft design. I don't really need this for what I'm using it for. So this shaft will be the first thing to be modified in order to fit the other gearboxes. The gearboxes are both 10 to 1, so 10 turns of the input shaft gets one turn on the output. Now, technically, I don't need a gear reduction with the motor that I have. I'm really only using these as a design convenience. Using this saves me quite a bit of trouble in having to build, you know, some type of a socket to mount the faceplate on, the bearings that those would be mounted to, and trying to attach a transmission between that axis of rotation and the motor output. That might make more sense as we're putting this together, but using one of these should save me quite a bit of time. Now, I bought two because I originally wanted to build the entire turntable into my bench itself, like use the structure of my bench as the frame of the turntable. But I've since had a change of heart and will only be using one. What I had planned to do is use one of the holes in my bench top as sort of like a PTO, a power takeoff. Something I could just drop a three or four jaw chuck or a faceplate into and have it sort of at the ready whenever I needed it without it taking up additional space in my shop like a freestanding turntable would. Basically the thought was to bolt the motor and gearbox combination underneath the bench along with the controller and electronics kind of nice and tucked that out of the way. That like I said would give me a top accessible socket to plug in the turntable or the chuck but that obviously would only make it a horizontal turntable. In order to go to vertical, I thought I could build accessories for it, and that's where the second gearbox came in. I could plug the second gearbox down onto the top of the bench, and then attach the same faceplate or motor to that, turning it effectively into a vertical turntable. I might have gotten those backwards. Now that would have resulted in a massive gear reduction. Ideally, I'd use just sort of like a right angle bevel gear, but fortunately for TIG welding, these things want to go slow, so I don't think that would have been a problem. 
So what I'd like to do is modify these components so I can attach the DC motor as close to and as compactly to the gearbox. It actually might look something like this. And then slip all of this inside a large piece of structural steel tubing. I think if I keep the overall form factor square, I can then flip the box over in any direction on my bench, you know, clamp it down, and maybe have a more versatile and easy to store turntable. In order to do that, I'm going to have to modify this shaft, it doesn't currently fit, and modify the gearbox flange, attaching the DC motor directly to this and then screwing this back onto its gear drive. My original thought was just to attach the motor directly to the new gearbox, but this has the worm gear built into the shaft. This would be a lot harder to modify than the reduced shaft on its gearhead. I was hoping to find sort of a keyed arrangement where I could take this off and then attach it directly. Like I said, I don't need the amount of gear reduction that this setup is going to give me because of the variable speed control. But unfortunately, it's one piece. This thing is German and apparently those folks don't screw around. All right, so I have this blocked up more or less how I envision this going together. I've got about a quarter of an inch between the smaller gearbox and the larger gearbox. I could have probably went a little bit tighter, but this should work out all right. I'm roughly marking out kind of the envelope of the smaller gearbox onto that flange. So while I was over at the mill, I took the opportunity to machine a couple of plates, like mounting plates. This is just, I mean, it's bigger than I need, heavier than I need, but unfortunately this is all I had on hand. I should be able to get two long welds up against the flange, and then probably a short stitch up at the top here. So I'm just going to do a couple of very quick tacks just to keep everything in place then break it down and weld it out. All right, I think the flange turned out yeah, relatively all right. We've got the seal back in there. Just hope it fits back together. Just for a sanity check, I've hooked up the electronics and I'm going to turn it on, make sure it doesn't sound weird and that it turns, of course. So through the two gearboxes, that's as fast as it goes. I can slow it down. I can go to zero and then flip it the other way. Yeah, I don't know. It sounds all right. Well, I've got a little bit of a leak. But all in all, I think that turned out all right. Next up will be to go out and try to find a short piece of big structural tubing. Ideally, it'd be like a 10 inch by six inch that I can slip this into and just make it a, you know, a nice compact piece of equipment. Just uh, bear with me a minute while I go out and do that. Okay, I couldn't find a tubing of the size that I wanted. So I got some 3 16 plate and we'll weld one up myself. It's about five millimeter, and hopefully everything fits in here. All right, I think that should do it. You'll see why it's a little taller in a minute. It'll be for the ground clamp on the other side. It is a smidge longer than it probably needs to be. 
But for now, I think that'll work. The next step is going to be trying to lay all these components out intelligently inside of the space I've given myself. I've got the motor in the gearbox, the power supply, and the motor controller. Now once this is all closed up and welded, the only access I'll have to the inside are two plastic end panels I plan to sort of countersink into what will be, I guess, the top and the bottom, or the two sides. The only thing coming out the side panels will be the potentiometer for the speed control and the hookup to the power. I've got one of these computer type case power connectors with a built-in power switch. Now the way I have the potentiometer wired on this control board, the, the center or the middle of that wiper is sort of the reference voltage. And what that allows me to do with this controller is rotate the motor in both directions based on the position of the potentiometer. So the middle of that range is zero and the max in either direction is the max RPM for this particular combination. Now that's nice because it saves me having to add and wire a reversing switch, but what it does in this case is it, it sort of cuts my resolution down. Zero to max RPM in either direction is now only half of this potentiometer range, which is something less than 300 degrees. So what I did is turn to eBay and found one of these multi-turn potentiometers. So this is a 10-turn potentiometer and hopefully gives me a lot better resolution. So now I have five turns in each direction to control the motor speed and tune it down to sort of the linear distance per second I want it to move for the particular size of part that will be welded. On the mechanical side of things, I mean I'm somewhat constrained by the fact that I have such a large offset, but that was done, you know, sort of by design. I want this offset so that when I flip the box up, either for horizontal or vertical welding, I have an offset off the top of my bench. And potentially I could add, you know, larger turntables to the top, a larger platen. Earlier when I mentioned that the worm drive was a design convenience, what I was talking about is that using this gearbox saves me the entire mechanical buildup of whatever this transmission would have looked like. So had I not used this, I would have probably had to put a couple of pillow block bearings or turned some seats to press some bearings into. I would have had a through shaft to mount the chuck or whatever to on the other side. And then on that through shaft, I would have needed a sprocket or a gear of some kind to be able to connect that motive force from that motor to the rotational axis. Here, it's already sort of done for me. This gearbox can already take the axial loads. It has bushings or bearings or something in there. And the mechanical connection obviously is already taken care of. The two downsides to this is one, I have additional gear reduction I didn't necessarily need. Though again, for TIG welding, my speed range here should be more than adequate. Might hit a limit if I tried to like MIG weld, wire weld, that's obviously a lot faster, but I don't really do a lot of that. The other downside is that I now have a small spindle bore. What I would like to have done is made this bore at least, I don't know, two, two and a half inches. And that way if any parts have sort of a tail, it's, it's just like the lathe. If you want to sink parts into the chuck and into the spindle bore, the larger the spindle bore, the better. Here I'm not going to be able to do that. I'll probably make this a hollow shaft just so I can get purge or back gas to a part if I need it. But I won't be able to nest any of the work into the three quarter of an inch spindle bore. So I'm going to noodle this and you'll probably see all the rest of this happen in fast forward. It's just going to be a bunch of layout and drilling holes. Thank you. 
All right, no lie, I'm pretty sure it took me longer to clean up my bench in order to get this shot than it did to get this far with the project. Now, I know a lot of that happened quickly. Just a quick tour, I've got the mounting features for the large gearbox, two blind square holes, that'll be for clamping or fixturing the actual gearbox itself to the bench. There's a little step cut out in here that creates a recess for the ground clamp once the through shaft of the chuck comes through and keeps it below the surface so I can still flip the positioner around any way I like. I don't know if this is the smartest way to do it, but I'm going to run with it. Not attaching to that shaft would have meant some kind of brushes or braided cable, spring-loaded stuff, and because I'm using the gearbox, I don't really have any access to that shaft other than here. Though I guess I could have closed it, done that on the inside, and just had a provision to ground to the, the casework itself. And the inside was a little bit tricky, but I think it worked out. Imagine this thing is closed and it's got to be assembled. The motor and gearbox would come in from this end and bolt through the other side. The power supply and speed control has a couple of brackets to mount it and sort of float it inside the steel structure. And I can round the switch over to the control panel that I think is going to be on this face. This is the one face I guess along with the bottom that the weld positioner will never sit on because of the chuck. I'll have another cap down the end, and that's what you see the small angle iron for. And then the blind holes for clamping fit sort of in these empty spaces. So here I'm doing somewhat of an aggressive like lay wire type of weld. I want these beads uh, to be a little bit proud so I have something to grind. I'd like all these edges to be nice and smooth and rolled over. So I don't want any really flat beads though, they would certainly do the job. It's 3 32nd wire, I think a little bit thicker would have been better. And I'm pulsing with the foot pedal. Just with a small wire in a lay bead like that. If the puddle starts to get away from me, it gives me a chance to, you know, in that moment where you back off with the pedal to sort of force the wire into there a little bit faster and pick up the heat again and, and just repeat. Again, I, I don't want to waste rod, but I want to keep the bead a little bit tall. So here I'm just clamping down a little one inch box section to serve as kind of a reference for me as I'm running along that weld. I'm going to be doing this standing up. You know, maybe with a hip up against the bench, balancing on one foot because the other one's on the foot pedal. And unfortunately, TIG welding isn't really like riding a bike. You don't get anywhere and you put on some pounds. If you don't do it often, you sort of lose the touch. Granted, my shorter welds aren't that much better, but these long ones I haven't done in a long time. And, and that rail might help me, you know, from going off-road. Even though in this case, I've got that ground edge and I should be able to follow that line visually. MIG welding would have likely been the smarter choice here. I would have probably been done already, to be honest. But it's fun getting some time on the TIG torch. I've pulled out a couple of my grinders. How often does a guy get to talk about his grinders? Now, although 99.9% .9 of the work was all done with the angle grinder, I really like these little pneumatic belt grinders. This happens to be a Dynabraid, a Dynafile 2. This one's actually pretty old. It's probably going on, I don't know, 15, 20 years. 15 maybe. No, probably 20. Anyway, you can't beat it for these sort of like square rectangular features. Now, I pulled out my little die grinder at 90 degree. This is a Husky. See, it doesn't get much use down here because usually I can get it done with the angle grinder. I usually use these mostly with carbide burrs. The sanding pads are handy, but to be honest, I forget that I even have them. Now, it may not seem like it, but an angle grinder can potentially be like a precision tool. Once you get the hang of these things, you can use them with a bit of finesse. Like you don't have to go in there all caveman style. But with these rotary grinders and features like this, the risk of undercutting is very real. So as you're cleaning up this corner, it's not that hard to end up with a couple of weird fluted corners that, you know, just don't look that great. I mean, it certainly doesn't matter for this thing, but you know, if you're doing something like fancy hand railings, ornamental stuff, and you're really trying to blend those welds in, these little air files are spectacular. And I think you can get them with different radius noses. 
Anyway, this is as much tension as this thing is going to get. I'm just going to wipe it down and paint it. We'll work on some other stuff while it's out drying. Now I know what you're thinking, but no, I didn't get it gold plated. But I did neglect to take all the dimensions I needed in order to make the shaft and the end panels. I also forgot to add the holes for the little rubber feet and the holes for the handle. So after a lot of soul searching, I made it yellow. It's a nice, calming, quiet color. That and I was spray painting outside. It's kind of windy today. Thought I'd play it safe. My neighbor's car is yellow. So it's a little tighter than I expected in there. There's a couple of screws I can't really get to. I really don't want to drop these because it means a lot of that stuff's got to come back out. I don't know if you can see it back there. I hardly have line of sight to it. I thought I would have had access from the other side, but I had to put the boards in first. All right, I managed to get it on there, but I can't get the box into the wrench off of the gearbox now. All right, so I had to resort to some good old fashioned cussing that seemed to have done the trick. All right, that was a nightmare. Okay, sanity check, now that I've got this thing all buttoned up, I wanna make sure it still works. Now, in addition to the power switch, I added an enable switch. Basically, starts and stops the motion. FYI, 10 turns on a potentiometer is a lot of flipping turns. So instead of trying to find that zero spot to stop the chuck or the turntable, I can just turn it off and start it here at the same speed. Anyway, power on. A power LED maybe would've been nice. And speaking of which, this probably isn't the most intelligent panel layout, but that's where I had the space on the inside for the back side of these controls. All right, let's build this platen. All right, so here's what I've come up with for a platen. I think you saw me make the shaft and cut the key. That all drops in through the gearbox. I didn't really have anything suitable for the top. I grabbed an eight inch aluminum round. This was actually one of the pieces I had in my kind of bender collection, like a bending die. I just pressed it on the shaft and took a cleanup cut. I'm thinking I may keep an eye open for those woodworking chucks, like a three or a four jaw. I'm pretty sure they're a lot thinner profile than the metalworking chucks are. But for now, I think I'll have some fun with this. Now, there's also a through hole for gas if I need it. And the top, for now, I've threaded it so I can maybe clamp stuff in from the top. The bottom just gets a snap ring. There really aren't any forces trying to pull this thing out. It's just there to 
keep it from walking on its own. And then in theory, the ground clamp fits right here. That should clear my workbench. It won't go anywhere when I'm in the vertical position, but this way, I guess I'll have to see if it, if it kind of walks itself off. The reason for clamping directly to the axis of rotation and not say like the chassis of the turntable or the bench, it's to keep the welding current from going through the actual bearings and mechanical components. So if you were to clamp to the body, the weld current could go through potentially expensive bearings, pit them, seize them up, generally wreak havoc. This way, hopefully it stays between the ground clamp and the arc through the axle, through the shaft. That's pretty cool. It's almost hard to see moving. All right, that's almost two revolutions per second at its top speed. That's 120 RPM, and that's a pretty good clip. Now, I'll be honest, I'm completely exhausted, but can't help myself. I want to try this thing out. I got just a uh, Huzuma, was it, from my scrap bin, and for now, just a piece of cold rolled steel. Just as a weight. It's a little too fast for me. Dang, that was actually looking pretty good. I should have kept going. I think I am gonna need a foot switch for this. All right, I'm happy with that. Here, I think it was still a bit too fast. It, it looked good under the helmet, but I don't know, it looks a little too concave here. So I have this old chuck that I've been keeping around, you know, just for this purpose. I knew this was coming sooner or later. And in order to mount that, I'd have to get rid of this aluminum plate. I do have some flat plate stock, you know, a little bit larger. But I don't think I'm going to get into that right now. Sooner or later, it'll get attached. Like I said, I just want to have some fun. What I do have, though, is this A-bomb sized forejaw. Whatever it takes, am I right? This thing's less than three inches. It came with some small rotary table. I've never even used it. It's still covered in earwax. But I drilled a couple of holes. I'm just going to screw this down, center it up, and waste some TIG rod on small tubing. Now, if you imagine a normal size chuck and maybe some long work in here, this obviously would want to tip over. It might not be long enough to necessitate like end support, but it may be heavy. And that's what these cutouts are for. I can drop a clamp into the hole in the table, just clamp it down either in this direction, or if I need more space, I can pick it up and clamp it in this direction here. First thing I found was some stainless tubing. It looks to be about two inches. It's not super thin wall. It's, I don't know, 332nd or so. I'm doing this without filler at five pulses per minute. The speed wasn't perfect. That's still something I'm going to have to figure out. But it appears to have worked out. Next time I need to fusion weld two short stub pieces of tubing, I think I'm ready. I don't know, all in all, for first try, I'm pretty happy with that. Just been leaning on random chunks of metal to get me in a comfortable position. I had thought about early on about adding some type of a, a socket with maybe a big nut and a collet or just a set screw to be able to tighten a little half inch round like a support arm. Something that when I didn't need it, I could just kind of stow it in the chassis of the machine. And should it have been helpful, you could just sort of pull it out and plug it into one or of two or three sockets and give you some place to, to rest your hand. But somewhere along the line, I started to see the light at the end of the tunnel and just figured I'd keep it basic.
I apologize I didn't really get any arc shots. I haven't seen any of the video yet, so I don't know how visible any of that was. But once you turn this thing on, it's just, you know, there's no time to think. It's go, 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 go. This thing is a, really a lot of fun. There is, though, something a little bit different about aluminum that I didn't detect with the stainless or the piece of steel before that. There's sort of another timing element going on. I mean, apart from the speed of the turntable, there's some aspect that just feels like I'm not totally in control the way I might be when the part isn't moving. I don't know how to explain it, like almost... I'd want another foot pedal for the table speed, but then that would screw with the consistent, I don't know. I, I guess I just have to get used to it. Have a look at this, for example. I started out here, the part was cold. It's all pretty much the same diameter, so the rotational speed was the same. The first speed was a little bit mm, inconsistent, let's call it, just as I tried to keep up the heat with the foot pedal as it started to slowly warm up. By the time I got to the second bead, the part had gotten so hot that the bead just sort of washed itself out. I let that cool down a little bit and put these down pretty much one after the other. And you can see the, the second one looks a little bit better, a little bit more consistent. But there's kind of that, you know, the, the temperature element that when you're working manually between your travel speed and the amp control, I feel like I have a little bit more well, basically control over. Whereas this, the part is moving at a constant rate, and if you can't keep it within your foot pedal control, I don't know, that still doesn't make sense. These are my first tries. I guess it's just a matter of getting used to it. And this part, forget about it, it was just a train wreck. But personally, I think the stainless part stole the show. Turned out gorgeous. What do you say we end this on that positive note?